How many of you would say that you feel like you are stressed educators? Rika, yes. Lila, yes. Ivona, yes. Andrea, yes. Right, Maria, yes. Um, Nabila, you're also saying stress, but Nabila, I know that you're with classrooms, so yes. Eliana, thank you for sharing that. Katrina, I also see you sometimes up. Right, now, um, out of curiosity as well, I'm just in the chat box and I've got lots of yeses coming in, so we've got lots of stressed educators. What would you say is your principal cause of stress? By the way, isn't it great that when you start to do a webinar, people start chopping trees, um, doing things in the kitchen, and there's all this background noise. So my apologies if you've got the sound effects with us today. Okay, time management. Time management, paperwork, admin people, heads, lack of clients, social media, sales. Right, right. So um, not actually knowing if you're reaching your students, that's a beautiful one. Um, I'm not sure your first name there, but uh, yes. Um, executive functioning, right. Yeah. Anything else? Anybody? Preparation. Uh, social media overwhelm. Right. Now, what I'm seeing in the chat box there, I think we've got two different types of things that are causing. Well, maybe we could say three. Firstly, we've got the entrepreneur educator because you are doing everything in your business. Second, we've got the classroom educator where we've got the question of admin, um, let's say functions of executives, heads, expectations from others and satisfaction of, of learning in, in that particular and the prep work to do with that as well. And I would say, could we add the third category as uncertainty? And the fact that we are living in such an uncertain world. And I think that's Sanella where you were saying about this lack and this constant trying to balance what's happening and whether we're going to bring in the money for the bread, that feeling. So let's go back to the slides. And a lot of the time, I do think that how we mentalize or how we cope then reflects on what's happening in our outside world. And I think one of the major challenges for everybody all over the world at the moment is with everything that is happening around me, how can I keep the balance and the equilibrium, let's take it into that word, and how can I really not be affected by everything that's happening around me? Now, I'm also gonna take this into the realm of um, the people who are actually suffering in the Ukraine war. I mean, that is horrendous how those of you who are educators in Ukraine are actually having to deal with that uncertainty of the moment, never mind the day or the month or the year. And unfortunately, we live in a world where we really don't know. And there are extremes, extremes of the Ukraine situation at the moment and extremes of inflation, prices. How do we keep up with the cost of living? How do we keep bringing in clients, companies that are shutting down their doors because they, they've closed the budget? And literally, how do we move forward with that? Now, we're going to look a little bit, firstly, at how we can come into managing our brains. Secondly, how we can come into using coaching. But I'm also going to come into this question of how we as business educators or, or even English educators can maybe think about some tips and tricks to move forward with our business, with our work, etc. Now, you know that we do talk about the neuroscience. And you know, when we talk about neuro, we're not only talking about the brain. We're talking about neurons. We're talking about, for me, it's about the holistic human. Uh, we have neurons in the brain. We have neurons all over the body. 
and in particular in the gut, in the heart. And I always think that we have to think of this brain, heart, gut connection and the fact that we operate as a holistic whole. We're not just a brain. So how do we connect into ourselves? And knowing neuroscience really can help from different perspectives. And I've just put down a few of these perspectives. And we're going to dive into each of these, by the way. Now, knowing the brain also helps us because trauma impacts the brain. Absolutely. And just to share with all of you, you know, we now know from, from scans of children, brain scans, that it can totally change the structure and the functioning of children's brains. Childhood trauma can affect the brain. And understanding that is also something for each and every one of us to, to think about. And we're going to look a little bit deeper into that in a minute. Understanding habits as well. Understanding ourselves, we're creatures of habits. Understanding neuroplasticity. Understanding that actually our brain is a prediction machine. Phenomenal. I wish we could all predict the lottery. I, I don't think we've got to that extreme yet, but who knows with a little bit of practice what we could do. And also the fact that, you know, resilience can be developed. We're not born resilient. It is something that we really can develop. So let's take these step by step. And this is about bringing the coaching and the new science to help in all of these. Now, the first step is understanding the emotional brain. Many of you have done the course with me. I see um, many familiar faces. So you know that we really do talk about fight or flight. We talk about how when the amygdala becomes aroused, that message is then kicking the brainstem, which is then going into a full body response. And that's when we have this fight or flight reaction. Fight or flight reaction means we're pushed into a survival mode. In a survival mode, the logical, rational, analytical part of the brain is shut down, if we like to say it that way. And thank God, because if you're standing in front of a tiger, Thank God that you're not standing there debating what to do. Thank God that your amygdala has sent that message in like flash of lightning and you have responded, maybe even without realizing it. I remember years ago, and this is a little bit of a funny example. I was sitting, as you do as a teenager, at five o'clock in the morning, having breakfast after being out at a disco with some friends. And I remember sitting at this in, on this terrace in Spain, five o'clock in the morning, chocolate y churros, it's the tradition over here. Some of you may know that. And literally, we were sitting, four of us at this table, and if you like, in the points of the compass, north, south, east, west. A fight broke out, and I kid you not, each and every one of us fled from that table. But the funny thing is, we all fled in the direction of our compass. So one ended up at the north, one at the south, one at the east, one at the west. And, you know, when the fight had finished, we kind of looked at each other and went, what happened? And literally, each and every one of us, we'd just gone without thinking. And we've just gone in our nearest direction of escape. And I'll never forget that because we couldn't stop laughing. But now when I look back, I actually think, wow, as soon as there was danger, the brain responded. So understanding this is key. This is a beautiful survival mechanism that we have 
inbuilt in each and every one of us. Now, the problem is when this gets out of hand, because nowadays we all have different tigers. Your tiger might be your head at the school. It might be one of your clients triggers you. It might be family. It might be situations. It might be, and they're not life and death situations, but what's happening is we're responding in the same way. We're responding as if we are under threat. And this is where it's about observing ourselves and starting to observe these reactions. So when we're with somebody that triggers us, observing what's happening and observing what's the reason for this trigger. What's the reason I'm feeling this? What's the reason that this is tipping me? Now, believe me, we're all human. Even me, I get triggered. And when I get triggered, woof, we're human. But the interesting thing is, the more you start to observe and you start to understand where the trigger is coming from, the more you start to become proactive instead of reactive. But it's a lot of self-work and it's a lot of self-observation. And believe me, there might be thousands of times that you're triggered before you get to that point where you're able to deal with that trigger and change it. But it's not easy. Olivia, yes. And, and the goal is not to block it. You know, if we block it, we may go into even more amygdala hijack. Because when you start to suppress feelings and suppress reactions, actually, it's almost like a pressure cooker. At some point, woof you're gonna lift off that lid and it's not gonna be pretty. I know, I've done it myself. So it's not about blocking, it's really about recognizing, observing and understanding it, you know? And I think as well, it's about having forgiveness for ourselves, forgiving ourselves for these reactions. They coming from something Lila, absolutely, self-compassion. You know, they always say we cannot give to others what we're not doing to ourselves. So how can we be compassionate with others when we don't have that self-compassion? So self-understanding, it's a long journey. But the key is to understand these reactions, understand the brain, and start to manage them. Control them if you can observe them and come into being proactive. And being proactive might mean actually sitting down with that person saying, can I share with you? I, I get very triggered. And this is what's happening with me. And may we talk about how to deal with this? Now, Daniel Goleman in his book, the, um, the book on emotional intelligence uh, from the 1970s, he was the first one to really label this amygdala hijack. And that's when, you know, the lid comes off and it's not pretty and you just go without realizing it. And then afterwards you think, oops, what happened? Road rage definitely is uh, something that I think all of us have or are guilty of still maybe <laughs> sometimes. Things like that, you know, and, and this is the understanding behind it. Now, um, Bessel van der Kolk, um, if you are not familiar with Bessel van der Kolk, um, he actually spoke at one of our conferences a couple of years ago, and he is one of the most experienced psychologists in the area of post-traumatic stress disorder. And he really does talk about this stress response and how, uh, you know, how can we manage it? His book, The Body Keeps the Score, I highly recommend it. It really helped me a lot to understand my brain and to understand post-traumatic stress disorder. And by the way, he did say that, you know, in that book, he says that most people will suffer stress at some point in their life. 
and 90% of the population, we will have panic attacks at some point in our life. For some people, it happens when we're young. For others, it happens when we're older. 90% of the population. Now, we all think that we're an island and it open, only happens to me. No, it happens to all of us. All of us. The problem is we don't talk about it. So very important to understand the emotional reactions. Now, this is um, a slide that I use on, on my course. So those of you who have done my course, you, you recognize this. On the right side, we've got that, that little trip with the amygdala aroused, kicking into the brainstem message, into fight or flight response. That's that fight or flight on the right side. Fight, flight, or freeze if you can't do something. Now, what we're talking about is coming over to the left side where we're starting to observe those reactions and we're starting to come into conscious decisions of how to deal with that situation. And that's what we're aiming for. If it's not fight or flight, if it's not the, the building falling down, fire in the house, we need to be thinking about becoming proactive. And social pain, you know, really recognizing that social pain also affects us all. And again, how can we bring that compassion when others are feeling social pain and when we are feeling social pain? And we're talking about rejection, exclusion, unfairness. And in the school, there, you know, in the school environment, there is there could be so much of this happening. And let's take this one step further. Post-pandemic, there can be a lot of this happening. Sylvia, did you want to jump on? I've just seen, did you raise your hand there? Sylvia? Um, did you want to jump on? Just give me a nod and I'll see if I can unmute the microphones. There you go. I've just... Uh... Yes. I, I just saw that your hand moved. Did you want to jump oh, on? No, no, sorry. Thing? I was taking my cat, sorry, <laughs> out of the computer. Sorry. Ah, so your cat wants to hear what we're saying today yes. as well, huh? She is with me. Yes, Fantastic. sorry. Fantastic. Okay, so no, that's fine. Um, so post post uh, pandemic, we really do have a lot of trauma. We've got a lot of trauma with children who cannot reintegrate. A lot of social pain because children are frightened to come together again. They're frightened to socialize, uh, but they're being left apart. They're being separated out. And this is for the emotional brain, for the social brain, it's pain because we are built to be together. We're wired to connect with each other. So, so much of what happened in the pandemic is trauma for all of us. And trying to find our way back in after the pandemic is key. And you as educators, how you can help kids to reintegrate, but also not be affected with that stress and with that emotional burden. And I do think coaching helps to stay into that compassionate zone. Now, remembering that coaching is about, I'm really sorry, what can we do to change this? That's coaching. Looking for solutions, looking for the way forward and not staying in that trauma and drama. And in fact, Bessel van der Kolk, in his book, he concludes, psychology and psychotherapy are not the answer because they keep the brain in the trauma, in the drama. And the best thing that we can do is, yes, acknowledge the pain, whatever happened, the trauma, but we have to then shift the brain into solution, into new focus, into how do we change this? Where can we go with this? And that's what we need to do in the classroom now. We need to really be compassionate. 
and move the kids into what's the solution here. And without us telling them, this is what we think the solution is, trying to get it from them. And also recognizing, you know, that social and emotional pain is real pain. The brain does not distinguish between physical pain and social and emotional pain. The same areas of the brain are lighting up. So understanding this is also key for us. And another thing that we've, we've you know, I've said this at the beginning. Um, if the amygdala senses uncertainty, you're going to get full focus on that threat and full engagement of the brain's energy to resolve that threat. That's where your brain is going to go because your brain's trying to save you, us. Lila, thank you for sharing that. And, and I think you're not alone. I think all of us, and especially now today, and especially educators, because I think we're overloaded with the, the emotional, um, I'm going to say, troubles of the learners, the emotional troubles of the ones trying to steer the ship in the establishments and the environments, trying to lead, trying to steer, trying to bring out what they want it to be. So there's a lot of all different conflicts coming from different sides and lots of trauma coming from all different angles. And this is the question, how do we sit there and say, okay, recognize the situation, how can we move forward with this? And it's not easy, it's really not easy. So let's just uh, reiterate what we said, um, trauma impacts the brain, it really does. And uh, really traumatic stress, prolonged traumatic stress, can also produce lasting change in the brain. And you've got overproduction of cortisol, overproduction of noradrenaline. And we've got this constant prefrontal cortex signaling, trying to get the amygdala calmed down. So we've got this overburdened brain. And that then is causing anxiety and anxious behaviors. So the question is, okay, we recognize this, so how can we change it? Now, awareness is also not only from the learner, but it's also from us. We have to become aware of how we're speaking, how we get the focus, how we get them into the learning, but we also need them to think about self-talk, focus, and the process of learning. But away from the classroom as well, it's how to manage self. And powerful co coaching conversations, you know, coaching is not only for others. Once you know the techniques of coaching, you can really start asking yourself some of those powerful questions. And you can really start turning it onto you to become your inner coach. How many of you would say that you actually do that? Maria, you're nodding, yes. Yeah, Ina, yes, you're nodding. Uh, yes, and Lila as well, fantastic. Now, everything is about understanding the key, the key things to be asking ourselves. Now, we are going to use powerful conversations with our learners whether it's troubleshooting issues, problems, brainstorming, emotional triggers, even if it's learning how to learn, or even if it's talking about the brain, then let's talk about this, you know, get it out on the table. I always say, if there is a pink elephant in the room, you have to get rid of it. And sometimes that means the honesty card as well. And sometimes that means sitting with that person saying, look, may I share with you what I'm sensing? I'm sensing maybe there's a lot of stress today. And may I ask, how are you today? 
what can I do to help you to come into this learning situation? And if it's a private conversation, just sitting with that person and getting it out and really finding out open questions, key questions, and these powerful conversations can be used at any time. They don't have to be long. They have to be on point. So coaching is a vehicle. It's a vehicle to bring understanding. So we've looked at trauma and we've looked at the key point is understanding the emotional brain. Now, a little bit later on, I'm going to go into some tips of how we can manage our stress. So we're literally going to go into some practical tips later. Firstly, I'd just like to talk about the fact that our brain is a creature of habit. Right from an early age, our brain is creating patterns and programs. You know, the brain actually loves to do that because when the brain creates something that then operates from that subconscious level, the brain doesn't need so much fuel. It doesn't need so much focus and attention and energy because you're just doing it. You're on cruise control. You're on automatic pilot. But when you have to learn something new, when you're thrown into an environment where everything's different and your brain is playing with new, the brain needs more fuel, more attention, more energy, more focus. And could we say the brain might not like that? Because it's kind of happy in that cruise control. And Maria, yes, the brain loves stability. Unless you've got a brain that is trained to love change. Everything is about what you habituate your brain to. Now, I know that from my childhood, from my childhood, um, if you like traumas, my brain is accustomed from a very early age to change. I need change. I need to be doing something different. I need to be moving. I need to be traveling. I need to be doing things that are uh, keeping my brain stimulated. I'm not one that comes into having routines every day. Every day for me is different. But that's because from an early age, that's what my brain became used to. Now, Nazreen, I'm going to, um, I'm going to argue on that one. Because, you know, the neuroscientists, they don't agree on this point. Some of them say 21 days, some of them say 40, some of them say 72, I think. Really, we get so many people saying how many days to change a habit. Now, the one thing we need to remember is a habit is a very deeply ingrained neural pathway. It's impossible to change it. The only way we can really, really change a habit is by creating a new habit. And you have to keep repeating that new path away in the brain. And the more you keep doing that, the more you keep doing that, the deeper it's getting, the deeper it's getting until sometime in that future, your brain is going to tip into that new one because you're doing it so much and the old one starts falling away and falling away. So changing a habit or breaking a habit is not possible. You have to create a new habit and keep reinforcing that new habit. But that requires focus, attention, energy, and discipline. And I do think it depends on how much you're doing it, how often you're doing it, and that will give you how many days it will take you. And I think we're all different. We've all got different brains. I think we all agree it's not going to be three or four times. However, there is a part of the brain that actually recognizes repetition. Basal ganglia area of the brain actually detects when you've done something three times and it starts to create the seed of a new habit, starts to pay attention. Goodness, Rachel's done this three times. Ooh, got to be attentive now. 
but then you have to build it and build it and build it and keep going and keep going and it's not easy so understanding about habits you know not only for learners but also for us understanding that we can change behaviors we can change habits but not by breaking the old one we have to do it by creating new ones and this leads us very nicely into this topic of neuroplasticity we can change our brain at any age oh we it took you almost half a year to start getting up at six well done wow half a year you see it really depends everybody's different everybody's different and i don't think we can really label a time because i think each and every one of us Again, it depends on how often you're doing it, if you're really consistent with it, how much focus and attention you're putting into it, how much motivation you've got to do it is also key. So, Irina, well done. Absolutely. Neuroplasticity. I, I share this often with my course participants, and forgive me if I'm repeating this. Um, as many of you probably know, I am not a young spring chicken anymore. I would say I'm quite a mature person on earth now. And I grew up with a very pessimistic view of the brain. I mean, in, in those years, and I'm talking late 60s, early 70s, we didn't talk anything about the brain. And I kind of thought, okay, when you get to the age of 40 or 50, which is kind of like where my parents are, and then you kind of go into that decline and then you die. And that's life. That was my pessimistic view of life. Now, little did I know that in the 1970s, actually, we had some very brave neuroscientists starting to fight with those who said that the brain could not change. Because right from the 1920s, and I believe it was um, uh, Ramon y Cajal, the neuroscientist in Spain in the 1920s, who did these beautiful, beautiful pictures of the brain. He's very renowned for all these brain cells and neurons that he drew beautifully. But he also gave a message out there, which the neuroscientists took as Bible, as gospel, which was the brain cannot change. And so from the 1920s up until the 1970s, that was really the rigid belief that we had a fixed brain. If you lost brain cells, you lost them forever. So no wine drinking, no blue sniffing, because that was it. You lost your brain cells forever. Now, in the 1970s, that's when we started to have the ones saying, no, the brain can change. Definitely. And from the 70s up to today, we have so much research demonstrating how we can change the brain structurally and functionally. We can. Again, we come back to that changing habits. It's not easy because we have to create new neural pathways or we have to learn something new, or we have to expose the brain to new situations, new environments. It's not easy. We're fighting the resistance of our brains for stability, continuity, and that sort of feeling of comfort. And maybe this is what we could say is coming out of our comfort zone is when we're tipping into that neuroplasticity and we're changing the brain. Now, permission to blow your heads off, everybody, a little bit here. Because the brain doesn't only change with real. The brain also changes with unreal. Now, let me give you an example of one of the research uh, experiments that, that demonstrates this. Two groups of people, one group physically exercising their little finger every day, I believe it was for 20 minutes, moving the little finger up and down, up and down, up and down every day. By the way, after a couple of seconds, it really hurts if you want to try it. It's not pleasurable. So they were doing this for 20 minutes, and I think it was over a month. And another group of people 
who were only imagining that they were doing it for the same length of time, for the same duration, only imagining that they did it. The group of people that were physically doing it demonstrated an increase of muscle mass of 53%. The group that were only imagining it also demonstrated an increase of muscle mass of 35%. And all they did was sit there and imagine it. Now that's food for thought, everybody, because that also means, look at all these athletes. I saw myself breaking the record. I saw myself jumping so high. I saw myself doing it. Visualization. Imagination. So understanding as well the power of our brain to actually imagine and change structurally and functionally. And I'm going to leave that one with you. Now, one thing as well, I want to ask you, and I'm going to ask you this, and I want you to be very honest with me. How many of you would really say that you are a role model of neuroplasticity in your life? You are demonstrating to the world that you are constantly changing your brains. Nada, fantastic. Great to see that. Olivier, not yet. Oh, Olivia, I beg to differ. I think you're doing very well, actually. <laughs> but only because you've just done the course. I know that. Andrea, you're working on it. Right. Estefania, not really. Okay. And I think this is the question for all of us. We know about neuroplasticity since the 1970s. How are we demonstrating it? Now, I would suggest that, you know, we are changing the world. You are changing the world. We are changing the generational, um, I'm going to say, acceptance of what and who we should be at a certain age. And they do say, and believe me, we've got some amazing 90-year-olds, 80-year-olds in the world who are demonstrating to us how to be super agents. That's what the neuroscientists call them. And they say that the 80s are the new 60s, the 70s are the new 50s, the 60s are the new 40s, and the 50s are the new 30s. Yes. And this is, I think, this is where we're starting to change generations. We're starting to really demonstrate that neuroplasticity. And I think we are. But this is key for you and your learners as well. How many times do you get learners coming in? I can't do this. I'm too old. Mm -mm. No longer an excuse. We can learn at any age. And in fact, I do think this is about now changing societal expectations of how we live our lives. And the first thing we need to change is the message to children in schools. And we need to be saying to children at the age of 16, 17, 18, you do not have to need to know what you want to do for the rest of your life because for the rest of your life, you could do many different things. When I look at my life and I look at, I left school when I was 16. I never imagined I would be here now today with one BA, three MAs, qualified lawyer, everything that I've done through life never imagined that at the age of 16 and the pressure on me at the age of 16 horrendous and this is where we also can change that sort of perception of what they should or shouldn't be doing because we can go back to university at any age now a few years ago we had the oldest graduate in the world 89 years old university of toronto yes and a woman by the way ladies yes 89-year-old lady, the eldest graduate in the world. I want to be one of those when I'm 90. I don't know about you. But yes, this is the, the prospect that we have. The other thing that we need to be changing with society is retirement. No way. 
that that word doesn't even come into my brain. It doesn't exist. The expectation that at the age of 50 or 60, we should be leaving work and doing nothing is the worst thing we can do for the brain. These super ages that are coming into their 90s, the neuroscientists are fascinated by them and they're asking themselves, what do they have that's getting them to that age with the most amazing brains? And what they've discovered, three factors, physical exercise, mental exercise, they never stopped doing something, whatever it was, and social connections. Those are the three factors that they all have in common. And Katrina, I want to say well done. And I do want to say well done because many of you ladies, I know that you've also done your educational uh, research, development and studies as well as having kiddies. So, wow, yes. And yeah, learning is never learning. Learning is never ending. And I'm actually going to share with all of you, and I know that my, uh, let's see if I can play it from here. I know that my uh, participants know me uh, from this and we do this on the course, but I just want to see if I can share the hottest grandpa with you. Now I'm just stopping it. Can you just give me a nod that the screen has changed and you can see the video? No, okay. Modern technology, don't you just love it? Right, let me just get the video on the background there. And I'll move it onto another, another screen. Hang on, I need to come out the sides. Technology, this is the commercial break, everybody. Let's do the adverts now while I just get the link. Okay. And just putting it onto another window. I think some of you already know uh, the hottest grandpa. If you don't, this is. Okay, I'm ready now to share it. This for me is one of the greatest reminders of neuroplasticity. And if ever you feel unmotivated, if ever you feel down on the ground, I strongly recommend watching this video. Here we go. <笑>可是你知道吗为了这一天我孤独准备了六岁二十四岁我当话剧演员四十四岁开始学英语四十九岁创造了造型养病到北京成了一名老北漂没房没车一切从头开始五十岁 我进了健身房，开始健身。五十七岁，我再次走上舞台，创造了世界唯一的艺术奇迹。他叫胡椒总督。七十岁，我开始有学习的。七十九岁，我走到了舞台。今年八十岁。还有追求相信我人的潜能是可以发掘当你说太晚了的时候一定要谨慎他可能是你最全的剑没有谁能阻止你无论你是该胜自己千万不要对我是最炫so if you ever 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 have a learner who says to you i'm too old i can't learn i'm never gonna learn this i strongly recommend you get this video out and you blast them with this video 
Isn't he amazing? And just even more amazing, um, one of my groups actually did some research on Mr. Hottest Grandpa. And apparently he, this year, became the first, I don't even know the word, octogenian, first 80s year old, to take out his pilot's license in China. He's just done his pilot's license. That's like, wow. How amazing is that? How amazing is that? Now, this, I think, is the, the sort of vision that we should all be aspiring to in life. You know, um, this agelessness, this, this understanding that, yes, we can train ourselves. We can come into. Now, obviously, I'm not saying if each and every one of us, you have your own circumstances and it, it's also about being careful with illness or with whatever, but within your sphere, what can you do to really bring neuroplasticity into your life? What can you learn that's new? What language can you add to the languages that you've got? What extraordinary event could you do? I don't know if some of you follow me, but I now and again, I take my amygdala for a spin. Um, I took my amygdala for a spin last month where I took it into a balloon. For the first time in my life, I'm riding in a balloon and it was a, a surreal experience. And I now and again, I really challenge my brain to, to understand, okay, what's happening to me? How frightened am I? How can I deal with that? What do I need to do in this situation? And I keep trying to challenge. I'm not suggesting that you go out there and do crazy things. I am just trying to say, what could you do that's different in your life? And how can you, through doing that, help your learners? And one of the greatest things that I've really understood over these past 10 years, 15 years that I'm in this and developing this. We cannot tell people what to do. We're moving away from that. People don't want to have this opinionated, judgmental way of life anymore. And the more that we can just come into being a role model that's enough. We don't need to do anything else. That's all we need to do. We need to be, and I say this always, we need to be the coach. We don't need to prove it. We don't need to demonstrate it. We just need to live it and be the role model. And the more that you're the role model, the more that people will start to look and say, oh, what's she doing? Or what's he doing? Oh, I want a bit of that in my life. And that's when they start to get curious. And when they get curious, that's when you can start to share what you're doing. Now, moving on, let's go into this question of the brain as a predictive machine. And, you know, the brain is quite fascinating. And um, our brain really, really does compare input from the environment. And then it sort of, predicts things with the internal models of the brain that we've got in there. And this is about also, I would say, listening to our intuition. How can we listen to ourselves more? How much are you listening to your predictions of what may or may not be happening? And once you start to tap into that intuition of what you're sensing, you start to be able to grow out rather than react and we come back to what we said before believe it or not i have a little story um pre-pandemic i was in panama and it was about six weeks before they locked us up and as i got off the plane in panama by the way i was the first one off the plane very proud and i'm running out to get into uh, the airport terminal they approached us with this temperature gun and they were all dressed up in this plastic suit. And honestly, this was pre-pandemic. We, we hadn't even really heard about it. It was happening in China, but it was so far away. 
And that, that put my brain onto red alert because that was just like bizarre. And from that moment on, I started to bring it, what was happening. And in fact, I came back from Panama and I started calling my friends, get ready, get ready. This is going to, all hell is going to let loose, prepare yourself. And I even, I went into boy scout mode or girl scout mode or brownie mode, if you know the brownies from, from England. I literally went into, okay, survival kit, candles, torches, matches, food, drink. What do we need for whatever is coming? And I really acted on my intuition. And I'm glad that I did because by doing that, I was six weeks ahead of everybody else. When they started to, to lock down and do everything, I was, I was mentally ready. And for that reason, I was then able to help many, many other people to start to get mentally, I'm going to say, reinforced. So you never know just how much you could be picking up those signals and really recognizing them to then intuit what's happening and then be able to help the people around you. And that could be in any situation. And resilience, resilience, as we said, can be cultivated. You know, whenever I think of resilience, I don't know about all of you, but I always have this image of a little child falling down in the playground. And just how many times did we do that? And we literally picked ourselves up, brushed ourselves down and went back to play. Isn't that life? And the more that we fall down, the more we still pick ourselves up. The problem is, I think that as we get older, we start getting tired and we start saying, not again. But that's life. That's what we did in the playground. And if we take that sort of metaphor into life, life is a playground. We're here and we're all in this experience. We're all falling down at some point, all of us. The important thing is how we stand up again. That's the important thing. And it doesn't even matter when we stand up again. The important thing is to stand up again. And resilience, you know, in the brain. Uh, Nada, yes, falling in tail, standing up. Definitely. It's the, well, we have two choices. We either stay down or we stand up. And there is that choice, definitely. But it's not easy to stand up, especially when it's a great fall down. And especially as we get tired and tired and tired and tired and we don't want to fall down again. And we, so interestingly, People who are resilient do have more white matter between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. Demonstrated. So the more you have picked yourself up and brushed yourself down and just got on with it, the more white matter you have between prefrontal cortex and amygdala. Fascinating, isn't it? And the activation of the left prefrontal cortex in resilient people is 30 times more stronger than less resilient people. Now, just to share with all of you, you know, this pandemic, um, I don't know if any of you have seen, uh, I did a webinar some, some time ago on the Black Swan event. And uh, Taleb was actually the author that wrote the book, The Black Swan, which is that very unexpected event in life that maybe wins you at some point. And I do think that the, the pandemic has been a black swan 
although he classifies it as a white swan. And he classified it as a white swan because he said it was certain to occur. I would beg to differ. But um, we're not going to argue on that. The problem is that we are in a world where we are living this uncertainty. And literally, tomorrow, anything could happen. If we think about, if we want to go into pessimistic, are we waiting for a financial crash? Are we waiting for fuel shortage or, or whatever? You know, we, we don't know. We're in this uncertain world. Now, I do think that this has impacted language trainers, language teachers, teachers of any kind. And, and in the event of the pandemic, we had a total overhaul of life, confinement. Many of you were forced to switch online. And by the way, everybody, we're just having Armageddon storms starting here. So I'm going to close my window before I get blown away. <laughs> One second, I'll be back. It's uh, starting to thunder and lighten. And, uh, and the window is banging. So all of this happened to, to many of, of you all over the world. It's being forced to change. Companies stopping trading. And by the way, it's still happening. Companies stopping trading from one day to the next. Language academies suspending, terminating. You know, so many things. Uh, having to go to training with masks. How can you do language training when you've got a mask on your face and you can't see what's happening? You can't hear them. A lot of uncertainty and a lot of negative things happening. Andrea, uh, sending you a big hug. I know you've got to go. Uh, Andrea, we will be in touch. I've got to uh, connect back to you. So my apologies, I'll, I'll do that. Now, let's just come into taking this in a different direction. And in a bit, we're going to come into how to combat everything. You know, we've said everything starts with us. If we can start to transform ourselves, manage ourselves, we can bring that to others. We've already said how we speak, how we focus, how we conduct the, pro the process, and this constant reflection, the awareness within us. And getting learners as well to think about their side, what's happening to them, how are they observing their selves, what's happening to their brains when they're in the learning process, when they're in an uncertain environment. How can we get them to be autonomous, to learn how to learn, to learn about themselves all the time? So let's just take it into the direction of how the brain likes to learn first. The brain loves real and personal, and the more that we can get our learners plugged into real for them, not for us, for them, that's going to get them into the learning. We've spoken about the brain being a predictive machine. The brain also wants to understand everything. So the more that we can explain to them about neuroplasticity, about emotional triggers, about how to deal with them, the more that we can help them to understand what is happening to themselves. Breaking it down into smaller digestible bits, that's going to get them into more certainty, more solid, more stability. And understanding what is their starting point, where are they scaffolding from, and spacing the learning out. All of these will contribute to more certainty, more focus, more attention, and you are helping them to pattern. That's what the brain does. The brain is a patterning machine. So what are the strategies for improving cognitive processes? Well, one of the major, major, major tools to help the brain, to calm the brain, to get the brain into more focus is meditation. And I can vouch in my life, it really has totally transformed my life. 
So since 2015, I started, since I started meditating, everything has changed. Now, I'm not saying that you should go out there and all of you take meditation courses. Um, maybe let's just debunk this a minute. Meditation is not about sitting there with an empty brain. It's not about sitting there and thinking about nothing. Meditation is actually about disciplining the brain. It's about bringing the focus and attention of the brain where you want it to go. Very um, interestingly, and I'm just looking at the black skies and the thunder and lightning around us, it's going to get very dramatic here. Um, last November, for the first time in my life, I went to a Buddhist workshop. And it was the first time I've ever been actually to a Buddhist monastery and sat with the Buddhist monks. And it was an introduction to Buddhism workshop. I've read so much about Buddhism all my life, but never actually sat with them. Now, the first thing that blew me away was they all started to talk about neuroscience. Yes. And they started talking about the books and the meditation and the science and how it's being proven. Fantastic. Now, what they actually said was, again, they're happy that we're starting to decipher that meditation isn't just about emptying the brain. Meditation is about focusing on something that you want to bring focus and attention and solution to. That's meditation. Now, when I actually started meditating, I actually started with um, transcendental meditation. And the one thing that I understood from that is they give you a mantra and you repeat the mantra, you repeat the mantra and you keep repeating the mantra. And it's more about getting the brain to go where you want it to go. That's the discipline and the focus that you bring to the brain when you start doing this. Now, I'm not saying that you should all go into meditational practices. What I am saying is, how can you come into controlling your brain? How can you come into discipline? And the, the, the Tibetan monks talk about the fact that the brain is like a wild horse. You either sit on the back, take the reins, take the control, and you steer and drive that horse. Or the brain's going to be running away without you. And definitely, I think that's what my brain did most of my life. And I was running behind it going, wait for me, until I literally got hold of it and said, right, now I'm going to get you where I want you to go. Uh, Olivia, a horse or a buffalo? I think <laughs> in some cases, my brain might have been the buffalo, definitely. Um, I'm just trying to communicate with the people in my house to see if they can come and shut the shutters upstairs because they're all banging and blowing and everything's going crazy here. So, um, Lila, you would love to hear that we're not taming animals. Well, I think it's about taking charge, taking command, and being, let's say, being the commander of the, of, of the ship, of the operating system. How can we fully, fully be in control of that operating system? This is our operating system. Now, the other thing to remember as well is that breathing instantly, instantly changes brain waves. Instantly. This is why when you're in an emergency or you're, you're ill or whatever, the first thing that they do is say to you, breathe, deep breaths. Because as soon as you start changing that breathing, you start to change the brain waves from very high stress brain waves to alpha brain waves. And that's what is the key. How do we get that brain to calm down? Especially when you're in a stress situation. Now, other techniques 
um, to calm down instantly. And, and these are also um, Tibetan practices. One other technique to get into alpha brain waves is massaging the roof of your mouth with the tip of the tongue. If you are ever, ever, ever in an emergency situation, and I mean dire emergency, and you need to calm down, massaging the roof of the mouth with the tip of the tongue will also instantly change those brain waves. Um, and just to share with all of you that nobody is listening to me in the house. <laughs> so I'm just trying to see if I can get them to come upstairs and uh, close these banging shutters. So meditation and breathing, these are things that you can share with your learners even. If you've got a very stressed learner, how open would you be that we take a few moments to just calm you into the right brain state for learning? Because if you're not in a learning brain state, we're wasting our time here. So helping your learners to come into calmer brain states is key to get them into learning states. Now, the other thing as well, exercise also enhances learning. Movement, also key. Um, gaming, also. Um, there is a study that demonstrates how Tetris helps the brain. And you know, I was reading this the other day because I have to confess to all of you, I've got a very addictive brain. I remember when I was studying um, at university, um, I actually had to throw my Tetris machine away because once I start, I don't want to leave it. And I can be there all night playing Tetris. My brain goes into that addictive state where literally it just wants to stay in that game. And I was doing some research the other day. What is it? Yes, uh, Olivier, same with Pac-Man, Mario Brothers, the same with games, because your brain is looking for the solution. Your brain is wanting to solve every single time. So every time you can't find the solution, your brain wants to go back in and do it again and do it again. So this is absolutely key, that gaming is great for the brain, but it's also addictive. And we need to pay attention that you can use it to enhance cognitive processes, but you also have to be aware that it could trip into that addiction. So these are tips to enhance cognitive processes. We've already said about real life. And I think they've, they've heard me and they're coming to do the, the windows. Um, napping, boost the brain with naps, brain breaks. Now they say that 20 minutes is beautifully the, the right time for a nap. It must be more than 10 minutes and less than 30 minutes. If it's more than 30 minutes, you start to go into the deeper brain states of sleep. If it's only 10 minutes, it's not enough. So between 10 and 30 minutes, power naps. You know, Margaret, Margaret Thatcher is famous for her power naps. I think she used to sleep two or three times, two or three hours a night and power nap through the day. Uh, Lila, you've had learners who you're sensing are not fully present and relaxed, yet, but they say they are. I think out of people pleasing and social awkwardness, how do you deal with that? Um, I would be honest. I would get the honesty card and, and really say, you know, um, well, I, I'm sensing this. But I'm also, um, when you say to me that you, you're fine, can I just challenge you on that? And say, what does fine look like for you? Or how could we get you into an even more uh, relaxed state? Or what needs to happen to get you into a learning state? That's the biggest question. So napping, 
can help um, even learning during sleep. Uh, you know, the scientists demonstrate now that there is a period of time when we are asleep that we can learn. The problem is they don't know how to pinpoint when exactly that time is. That's the problem. Smell. Smell in the background could also enhance learning. Uh, I don't know if you know the... Uh, you can hear that we've got bangs and crashes happening around us. Sorry about that. Um, I don't know if any of you know that uh, Proust effect. Um, it was a, a novel where he remembered his grandmother um, when he smelt Magdalene. Every time he got that smell of Magdalene being cooked or baked in France, it reminded him of his grandma because that's what she used to do when he was a little boy. And, you know, sometimes smell can provoke memories. You know, knowing that, how can we then use that to our advantage in a learning situation? Could it be that you could have some lavender when they're learning? I don't know. These are all ideas to enhance cognitive processes. And vision, visualizing, getting them to really come into um, seeing things, to imprint things, that's going to help them with their learning. Crash of thunder in the background, everybody, to make it more effective for you all. Now, I just want to come back into that importance of breathing. Um, apparently, and I did some research on this, mental, mental performance can actually be improved by inhaling pure oxygen. Wow. Could it be that eventually we should have pure oxygen in the, in the, in the classrooms? I don't think it's going to happen, but it's interesting to know that. And also, you know, there is this question of right-left hemisphere calibration, recalibration, and a lot of yoga teachers understand when you have right nostril dominant, when you're breathing, your left, left hemisphere is dominant. So you're in that logical, analytical, rational sort of focus. When you've got left dominant, you've got right, creative, emotional dominant in the hemispheres. So again, you know, all of this is golden knowledge when we come into a learning process. The question is, how open is our learner to explore this with us, to optimize the learning? And many of you know that when we come into um, neuro language coaching, we, we are constantly chasing the flow state. Flow state is alpha, and it is uh, the, the peak, peak uh, production state of the brain, if you like. It's the genius state. And how can we get into the flow? Well, eliminating the distractions, focusing on a single task, making sure that they're doing things that they enjoy. All of this is going to help them to come into this um, alpha state. And by the way, we have to make sure that the task and the challenge match the skills of the learner. If we are pushing them to do something that they don't have the skills for, they're going to get stressed. So we really have to make sure that they are able to, and uh, it's not too challenging. Um, I'm just seeing, Nada, you're saying, tell us how to help students overcome their trauma when you know their home environment is totally opposite, right? And there I think it is about um, coaching, coaching conversations. And it's about not, um, let me put this in a different way. As teachers and educators, if we can shift into the role of the coach where we are listening to them, 
we are acknowledging their situation, but we're not trying to judge, change, or do anything about it. We're just acknowledging, and I'm really sorry this is happening to you at home. And then pushing them into the compassion. What can I do to help you change your life? What can I do to support you in this difficult time that you've got at home? So coaching conversations here, it's not about us trying to solve everybody's problems. Coaching is not about giving advice. It's not about telling people what to do. It's not about telling kids, this is what you should do and this is what you shouldn't do. It's not about blaming the parents because I think we also have to acknowledge that many of the parents are traumatized. And unfortunately, those children are living in traumatized situations. So it's about acknowledging it, helping them to accept that's the fact, and then really asking those key open questions, how can I help? What can we do? How can I support you? And that's going to be the way forward as educators of today, definitely. Now, let's come into helping ourselves and helping life, enhancing life. We've looked at the um, enhancing learning. Now we're going to come into the enhancing life. Now, before I do, um, we've got a beautiful, beautiful hand up from a Galaxy Note 3. So Galaxy Note 3, um, I don't know if you joined us right at the beginning of this webinar. We were talking about certificates and the fact that we cannot issue certificates if we don't know your name. So may I ask you, Olivia, yes, welcome to the Galaxy. Um, may I ask you just to go on to those three little dots at the top of your um, video screen, there's three little dots. And if you open that menu, you can rename yourself. And I would be grateful if you just rename yourself before I open your microphone. And then if you can give me your hand again, then we can get you back onto the stage. So, Socrates said, know thyself. And here definitely, uh, you know, this is about how do we move away from being caught up in the feeling to being aware that we're caught up in it? And this is the metacognition, the observing, the proacting rather than reacting. That's one of the first things that we can do. Metacognition is key. I think this is the word of the century. We are becoming aware of our subconscious patterns, programs, brain. And the more we can make that part of the brain conscious, and the more that we can come into consciousness and we start waking up into what we do every day, how we do it, how we can nurture the brain, how we can sit in that operating system and operate it, that's when you are becoming the role models and you're demonstrating it and others start to get curious. And that's also how we can also control our emotions. Emotions are chemistry. We can change the chemistry of the brain. By the way, one of the first ways that we can change the chemistry of the brain is through diet. Everything that we eat is a chemical reaction in our bodies and brains. So we can change the chemistry. We can change the mood. We can change the emotional status that we're in. One way to help that emotional shift is actually by labeling emotions. The psychologists say that if we label the emotion, I'm feeling frustrated, I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling depressed, as soon as you name it and say it, you're shifting it from the emotional brain into the rational, logical, analytical brain. And that's taking out the heat of that emotion. So if ever you're feeling bad, name it, say it. Oh, Lila, yes, emotion wheels, absolutely. Fantastic. 
we've already spoken about meditation. Now, meditation really changed the brain. Meditation is a discipline. It requires sitting on your fire for as long as you can. And I'm really saying between 20 minutes, two hours, three hours, that's sitting in the fire every single day. Now, I, over the last years, I refuse to say that I'm busy. No matter how much I've got to do in life, and no matter how full my plate is, I'm never busy. I always make time, and especially for meditation, because for my brain, it's key, key, key to keep it happy. If you are looking to do deeper work, um, definitely neurofeedback helps. Neurofeedback is when you have a connection um, with, they, they put on this, this cap and that is connected to a computer and it's reading your brain waves. And you can learn to use those brain wave patterns and you can learn to change those states of the brain because you're seeing it on, on a screen. Now they're using this for a lot of children with ADHD, a lot of adults with anxiety, depression, also ADHD. And it's really a, a program helping us to manage and control our brain and to get to know ourselves. So I do recommend neurofeedback. No medication involved. This is about taking medication off the agenda, especially with kiddies. And kiddies actually love it because they have a computer game. And when the game, well, when they go into stress and they go into beta and strong brain waves, the game stops. And when they control their brain, they go into a nice calm state and they start to relax, the game starts. So it really helps them to train the brain. Now, another thing that helps to, um, I'm going to say, deal with trauma in the brain is EMDR. And this is a very interesting treatment. It's based on rapid eye movement exercises. And rapid eye movement exercises seem to do something to the brain. The curious thing is the neuroscientists don't, don't understand the reason that this works. But it does. Now, apparently, when we are traumatized, it's almost like the brain splits into two different pathways. You have part of the brain which is going into the everyday, what's happening battle, and part of the brain going into the running story. And it's almost like the brain splits into two different stories with trauma. And with EMDR, the brain comes back into synchronization again. They don't know how, they don't know why, but it does. Fascinating stuff. Life coaching, as I said, I strongly, strongly think that now educators of today, we are becoming more and more the coach. And I think coaching helps us to stay away from that burden of taking on the, the traumas, the troubles, and really being able to manage those conversations so we're spinning it back to get them to find their pathway forwards. Obviously, yoga is one of the best things that we can do as well for training mind, body, discipline. And, uh, you know, Bessel van der Kolk in his book, he really concluded, as I said, psychology doesn't work. And he concluded yoga and meditation were the best things that demonstrated the greatest results for trauma victims. Yoga and meditation. Hypnosis, 
could be a way forward. And obviously it's that continuous picking ourselves up in life. And I think as well, you know, the more that we are coming together with this, the more that we're also, when we see somebody fall, we're helping them to stand up as well. Now, what are the benefits of everything that's happening? What are the opportunities? How can we now change that focus of everything that we think was negative into positive? You know, actually working online has opened so many new doors for people all over the world. Your clients are not only the ones in your backyard, you've got clients everywhere, potentially. And also we've eliminated this stress of going to work of going to the schools, of sitting in a traffic jam. I remember in Germany, sitting in traffic jams four hours a day, two hours to get there and two hours back. Wow, no more. Never ever do I want to sit in a traffic jam to get to work. So we can cultivate better work-life balance. We can optimize schedules. We've got less travel time. You've got the comfort of your own home. Pre-pandemic, my idea was to become a digital nomad. Obviously, the pandemic stopped that, but maybe we're starting to rethink that again, many of us. And many of us at any age. And taking six months in South America, you can work from there. And really opening up those doors. Now, one thing we are going to be doing, neuro language coaches, we are going to be creating that sort of network for digital nomads. And I will be opening up um, my place in Spain for digital nomads uh, in, in our network to come and stay. Um, so definitely this is something that we're going to be doing and promoting and, and trying to see how we can create more of this where people want to move. I also think that, you know, it is not, it's an, an advantage that we are moving away from academies and schools and you are becoming your own businesses and you're becoming more independent. Now, I know that takes on the stress of being an entrepreneur and maybe in another webinar, we can address the language entrepreneur challenges and we'll take that into another webinar maybe if you would like everybody, maybe you can give me some feedback on that. And seeing the world, you know, we have a global market, global market. We're not limited anymore. And by the way, you can offer many other in your network to your clients. So if you've got a client that suddenly says, I want to learn Polish, you can offer a Polish language coach. Or if they want to learn Japanese, Arabic, whatever, you have a global market out there where you can create cooperation, collaboration, and come together with like-minded educators who are in this together. So we can also, I think from all of this, learn to be our own risk managers. I think it's always good to think of life a little bit like a chessboard and to look a little bit at life and say, okay, if this happens, I'm going to do this. If this happens, then this. If this happens, then this. And really start to brainstorm what is your A, B, and C in life, in a situation. And get a soundboard, get a coach. Become a coach colleague with each other, get a, a, an accountability partner who you can soundboard things out with, whether it's business, personal, but somebody that you have that trust that you know they're not going to breach your confidentiality and they're not going to overstep the line and tell you what to do. They're going to be your sounding board. And constantly having an overview, what's your big picture? of business and having an edge. You know, this is my passion that all of you as neuro language coaches or language coaches or whatever you do are demonstrating your difference. That's the key. There are thousands and millions out there doing the same thing. How are we proving the difference? 
And who can you work with? You know, could you create collaborations? Could you create additional offerings? Could you create, if you are a language expert, do you have somebody who is a cultural expert that you could then say to your client, hey, I'm working with this colleague who also offers cultural workshops. Or I'm working with this colleague, um, this colleague who offers um, financial English workshops or legal English workshops. How can you create additional offerings? Uh, Olivia, I love that. Building dream teams. Uh, Lila, yes, neurodiversity coaching. And I know that you're specializing into that area. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So thinking about what you need to develop and really thinking out the box. We're in a world where we see a lot of negatives, but how can we shift and say, what are the positives? What are the new things that we can create in this world today? So everybody, just want to stop here with a little bit of a quote from Martin Luther King. Hey, how many of us can identify with this? Yes, I think all of us. Definitely the continuous struggle, the continuous picking ourselves up, brushing ourselves down, moving forwards and going next. And just wrapping up now, everybody, we've been rolling for, ooh, we've been rolling for a long time, my apologies. Just wrapping up a little bit about neuro language coaching. You know, we are coming into about 1,200 new language coaches worldwide. Um, we're one of the only courses certified and accredited um, for language coaching. And the community, I mean, is phenomenal. You really are amazingly like-minded individuals, professional network. We do a lot of free webinars, workshops. I'm doing some touch bases next week, some master classes next week as well. And I'm hoping in September, we're gonna get finally the go ahead from the Spanish Ministry of Education to get that foundation up and running, hopefully, fingers crossed. 